I thought, uh, as I'm telling a bit of a story, I'd make myself comfortable and um, something's about being chill, so <laughs> I'm fairly chilled. I'm going to talk to you about social glue, which um, Kelly's already brought up, the expression social glue. It's a very personal take on it. Um, for me, it's that sense of belonging that one gets through connections which bind us together. It's connections that give us strength, energy and inspiration that oil the wheels of everyday life. If there is one thread that runs through my life, it's the desire to join the dots, to connect people, to search for the common denominator whilst appreciating and respecting the differences. Seeing people come together through common interest, and then stepping back and watching the sparks fly. Turning dreams into reality. The Big Chill was one such dream that was central to my life for many years. Someone said it reminded them of Jason and the Golden Fleece. An ancient Greek mission impossible. A voyage to an unknown land with a great task to achieve. I'm going to tell that story of how it happened. And my vision for the sequel. This is me at my first ever festival, Glastonbury, in 1983. Well, I did go to Reading once, but that doesn't really count. <laughs> the event was an eye-opener for me, a total inspiration, and presented a world of possibilities. I first heard the expression social glue from Brian Eno, great artist and innovator. In an interview a few years ago, he was talking about festivals, and his words resonated with me. He was talking about the lineup being something of a red herring. What we all really craved and valued was a sense of belonging. Sorry to lower the tone at such an early stage, <laughs> but I had to bring in the Iron Maiden. Um, two things for me. One, when she introduced the gates of Downing Street, it was the start of the slippery slope. But a stroke, I think, she introduced suspicion and mistrust to this country, and a new era of self-centered me culture followed through from that. And then there was her classic line, there's no such thing as society. Margaret Thatcher has a lot to answer for, and I can give thanks to her for galvanising me into action, and at least giving me something to rail against. If bankers and the rise of markets was endemic of late 80s greed, there had to be a counterbalance. Starting my own record label was my first self-employed job, ironically helped by that most Thatcherite of schemes the enterprise allowance which paid me £100 a week for a year and allowed me to set up a record label. Not content with just putting records out, Cooking Vinyl had its sights set on creating a scene, even if it was a small one. It was somehow more honest and homespun in its ideology, I thought. It championed folk and roots music, a more organic approach, and one that was perhaps a reaction to the huge studio budgets that were around at the time, with such 80s icons as Mr Phil Collins, though we just love him. It also got involved in events, and again I saw the power of pulling people together. I suppose I was on a mission. The Texas Campfire Tapes was our first and unlikely success, recorded on a Sony Walkman by myself, with a microphone resting on a log. This album cost a pound to record, if you take into account the, mic the uh, set of batteries and the cassette. It went to the top of the independent charts, amazingly, for a year and it's gone on to sell half a million copies. Without it, Cooking Vinyl would have folded within months. As it was, the label is still strong and independent now, even though I'm no longer involved in it. But for me, it opened my eyes to how people could come together around a common cause. You'll probably recognise this as an early Apple Mac. In the early 90s, one of these machines changed my life. I previously shied away from computers. MS-DOS was double Dutch at best. Apple made it simple for me, and within three months of owning a Mac, I'd started my own magazine, as well as becoming an electronic musician. One magazine was a labour of love put together by myself and my ex-partner, Katrina, in our bedroom, which was also our office. We published and distributed it ourselves, getting in the car and delivering it free to pubs, clubs, shops and cafes. On also laid the groundwork for starting a scene, it was recognised in time as a much needed alternative voice, and for many it came to symbolise the countercultural melting pot of ideas. At the same time, we heard about something called the World Wide Web. It was a perfect medium for disseminating news, ideas, and notifications, 
about parties and other events of interest. Coincidentally, those on the internet at the time tended to be the early adopters, technology geeks and electronic artists, who would all probably be interested in this, which was our first club event as the Big Chill. My idea was for an ambient Sunday social held in the back rooms of the Union Chapel in North London. The monthly events brought together a wide mixture, clubbers on a Sunday come down, fans of multimedia, tastemakers and bohemians, it made for a heady atmosphere. We were the first club to have its own website, and we also offered free internet access. This was early 1994. Somewhat radically, we had the quietest music in any club anywhere, an ambient soundtrack which gave people the space to meet others, a network, being able to hear each other talk. The VJs were as important as the DJs, and the central space was the most ambient of all, with full screen visuals and mattresses all over the floor in the side rooms. The attractions would change from month to month. We might have a dub room one month, an art installation the next. And those who gave us feedback that they could do with a tavern or dancing were probably missing the point. Very quickly, the Big Chill gathered pace, and soon the Union Chapel was holding up to 900 every month at our events. The press described it very quickly as like a festival in a club, so our mates were nudging us into doing one in a field. This one that you can see was the Black Mountains, not far from here, just north of Abergavenny on the road to Hay on Wine. It was on farmland protected on all sides by the Black Mountains, um, and a totally illegal event, if the truth be known. The Criminal Justice Bill was coming in, and at the time, uh, the police turned up on the Friday night with a freshly printed off copy and read it to us, rather hesitantly, I must say. They later realised it wasn't a rave. I think I programmed a circus for the Friday night because I thought we might have a visit. But we went on to have a, an amazing weekend, um, a non-stop um, ambient soundtrack with um, DJs and live music. Um, 600 people were there. Um, some ravers from Bristol got wise to the directions that were floating around on the internet and um, the security at the time, which was uh, myself and a few others, and a farmer with a pitchfork at the end of the road, um, waved them onto Hay Bluff, and I think the raid actually took place up there while we carried on chilling. <laughs> People loved the Black Mountains event. Before we knew it, we were being asked to do another. Katrina and I visited Norfolk, and that became a saga of epic proportions. I won't go into Norfolk, it would take up the whole of my speech, but uh, PeteLawrence.net has a blog on um, the whole um, roller coaster ride. And I think it was that roller coaster that uh, brought about some of the, um, the loyalty, I guess, that uh, the Big Chill engendered in a lot of people that came to it. They, they felt that they were on a journey with us and we were sharing um, our experiences with them. Um, the bankruptcy, the prosecutions, the court cases. It was a very painful time, but the Big Chill then found its feet and started growing. Locations for us, for us were really important, to find beautiful locations rather than characterless showgrounds or classic festival sites, as was the comfort factor. Somebody described us as the first boutique festival. I think that was because we made an effort to look after people and make those, their experience as pleasurable as possible instead of just fleecing them once they were through the gate. <coughs> the gate. We didn't have a VIP area. Everyone was a VIP for us. If people came backstage, they could probably be expected to carry a heavy flight case. We went on to do events at Lama Tree Gardens in Dorset, beautiful Victorian pleasure gardens, and we were lucky enough to be able to do this event at East Knoll Castle in Herefordshire, where the festival still is. If there was one big difference for many who came, it was the forum. It wasn't just about a weekend once a year for big chillers. There was a community, and I'm going back 10 years now, when the community first got going, and it became a real focus for advice, for reviews, for inspiration, for community, and for new initiatives. New clubs and events were set up by people just nattering on the festival and getting the impetus, and that for me was pretty important. Rob the Bank, the founder of Bestival, admitted that the Big Chill had inspired him to set up his own festival. 
And some people said they're a good example of social media 1.0. This is the big chill in Naxos. Again, an extraordinary story. A ferry disaster hit the front pages of the UK press when a Greek ferry captain decided that the football match was more important than steering his ferry. It was sad that the big chillers were uh, delayed by two days, and when they eventually got to, to Naxos, there was a uh, party like there was no tomorrow, I think would be a good expression for it. But the bonding that went on was just um, something that stays with me to this day. People were in search of magic. Several found magic. Chris and Isabel, Susanna and Dylan, Katrina and Murray, Robin and Victoria, Nikki and Dan, Nush and Anne. And those are just the ones who got married who met on Naxos. Not to mention all the friendships and artistic collaborations. Well, the Japanese asked us, what is the purpose of the Big Chill? It's not a question I've pondered, but they wanted to know as they were inviting us over to Tokyo. So for me, it was about connecting, about recognising those connections, about having a vision that we could together create our own magic. And about inspiring people, providing a platform where one could feel a sense of belonging, I hope. We never really spelt out the ethos, but many people seemed to tune into it. Here's some of the replies from Big Chillers that we sent off to, Jap to Japan. Alzinia, having a good time with people who fly in the face of the default behaviour in the 21st century Northern European culture. That default behaviour is to be cynical, negative and not mindful of people outside their close circle and their friends and family. The wonderfully named Bubble God. A place where you can talk to complete strangers and feel like you've known them for years. And from Mr. Tom. For me, it's changed over the years. It used to be about hearing new music I wouldn't hear anywhere else. But now it's far, far more. Someone said that they felt they'd found what they were looking for. And I'd say that applies to me. The best part was, I didn't even know I was looking for it. And of course, fun was an important element. One of the main ingredients. I probably didn't realise it at the time, but without intending to, and via our seeming indifference to commercialism, in the early years at least, we'd been building up a very desirable brand. Sponsors were queuing up to get involved. Many media types said we had the perfect demographic. We certainly had an amazing community. As we grew, there was more and more pressure to sell out. Budgets were skyrocketing. It wasn't easy. But for me, it was always a battle not to sell out about keeping the ethos intact, about integrity versus commercialism, about keeping it niche rather than trying to go mainstream, about looking after the people who supported us and helped us grow. The Big Chill did grow and it went abroad. Naxos, Goa, Japan, Australia and Egypt. It opened a bar, a club venue in London. Suddenly it had become a much bigger business. And with that came struggles for the heart and soul of the Big Chill. Inevitably, I won't dwell on what for me was the demise of the real Big Chill around 2006 to 2007. Let's just say the magic had gone. All things have a trajectory, a shelf life. The Big Chill had played its part and moved on to become something else. It was time for me to move on, to take stock to look at the aspects of the Big Chill that have been important for me. It was time to draw on new inspiration from the best aspects, a sense of community, to return to the core ideals, to revisit the ethos that had made the Big Chill special and unique for me and many others, and to look at what was going on around us. A lot had changed in the 14 years since the First Union Chapel Party in 1993. <coughs> I thought a lot about community, about the sort of connections that happen in a small community, about an honest trust and openness, a reliance on neighbours. I had a vision for a mutual support mechanism, a pooling of resources. Somehow it seemed in step at the time when people were making sacrifices, times were getting tired again. It was more like a village fate in its approach, but it was a global village. And in that global village there would be a picnic, a coming together, 
outdoors or indoors, plenty of dialogue, a cooking up of ideas, a mixing of ingredients, a gathering of creativity, a celebration to be spontaneous, empowering, and fun. In the village, there would be a reappraisal of the role of the guild, the dictionary definition of guild, an association of people for mutual aid, or the pursuit of a common goal, and a medieval association of craftsmen or merchants, often having considerable power. A community with a DIY approach, an anti corporate stance which supported the independents, the small businesses, the sole traders. Where artisans, craftsmen, designers, writers, photographers, and musicians could all hone their skills. We would refocus the idea of the guild for the modern world. And I wanted to do it in a community which would empower the individual by giving that person the tools to present their work and leisure projects in a creative environment where one could have confidence to try out one's ideas, to realise the fruits of their creative juices. <coughs> A community that believed it could start from a utopian viewpoint, based around bringing people together, one that didn't revolve around data capture or highly targeted advertising, and one that aimed to empower its members. And underpinning the whole thing would be the belief that we can still dream. Cynicism doesn't have to win out. The Big Chill was initially a dream. This one isn't just about making your dreams come true. It's also about helping others' dreams come true, too. Picnic Village, as a blueprint, is about aiming to live truthfully away from the mainstream. And that brings us back to social glue, about a common sense of purpose, and all the great unknowns which can be achieved through collective energy. The future is ours.